founder and chief horticulturist, David Salmon, uh, who will be leading today's presentation. Now, you may not be aware of it, but it is likely that we have butterflies to thank for David's interest in plants. Um, David grew up in Houston, Texas, and had an avid interest in butterflies um, during his childhood. And this led him to wonder um, exactly what butterflies and caterpillars fed upon. So David's curiosity about insects um, turned into a keen interest in plants, and we can thank that for, for David's ongoing interest in horticulture and, and founding High Country Gardens. Um, I'll have David begin in just a moment, but I'd like you to know that the webinar software allows you to type in questions at any time during the presentation, and then at the conclusion, we'll have about 15 minutes where David can answer your questions, and we'll try to get in as many as time allows. So feel free to type those in during the presentation, and then we'll get to them at the end. Um, so with no further ado, I will turn over the presentation to David. Well, thank you, Wendy. And uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the High Country Gardens Eco-Friendly Gardening Series. And today's presentation is on butterfly gardening. Um, as Wendy said in the introduction, my interest in butterflies goes way back to when I was a child. And I spent many years uh, collecting uh, butterflies and uh, raising my own butterflies from caterpillars. So it's certainly a topic that's near and dear to my heart and one that I maintain an intense interest uh, to this day. So I want to present to you today the basics of butterfly gardening so that you can also attract them and feed the larvae in your yard as well. Uh, the next slide, please. Now, the, I want to give just a basic introduction to butterfly gardening, and probably the, the most important thing to realize is that you're probably already doing it if you're a gardener. But as a gardening community, uh, providing for butterflies will really make a meaningful difference in creating habitat for our Lepidoptera friends. And gardening for butterflies is something that anyone who grows and loves plants can do. So. It's also important to remember that a garden that's good for butterflies is also good for other pollinators, such as bees and hummingbirds, who often share the same nectar plants and utilize the same ha habitat. It's also important to realize that a, a garden that's healthy for butterflies and pollinators is also healthy for humans, because we uh, share, all share the need for uh, a clean habitat, not uh, polluted by insecticides and, and other uh, factors. So let me just review with you the four basic elements of a butterfly garden. It's easy to do, and if you will do these four basic things, you'll have a successful butterfly garden. The first thing is that we need to provide flowers and food, and we do this by planting a mix of flowers that bloom from the start of spring through fall. This can involve uh, annual plants, perennial plants, woody plants, shrubs, and trees. But then we also need to plant food plants for the caterpillars because often the plants that the adult butterflies feed on are different than the food plants for their caterpillars. The next element of a successful butterfly garden is leaving bare patches of excuse me, is providing shelter. And we can do this in a number of ways. Probably first and foremost is leave bare patches of ground. And this means portions of the yard are just bare dirt, no mulch, no gravel, but just bare dirt. And then we also want to provide some places for the adult butterflies to hide, particularly over the um, winter months and during the, the uh, nighttime. And this is easily accomplished by just having some small brush piles in underused corners of your yard. And then finally, and perhaps even more importantly than small brush piles or bare earth, is we want to leave our herbaceous plants standing over the winter to protect the overwintering eggs and caterpillar pupa that are waiting to emerge. And you can see this is a picture of my front yard in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Just had a, 
uh, snow on the landscape, as you can see. But what is also evident is there are a lot of plants that are standing over the winter. I don't cut them back in the fall because these provide shelter for adults, eggs, and the pupa that are waiting to turn into butterflies. Next slide. And of course, when you're doing any type of habitat gardening, and especially butterfly gardening, we need to provide water and a mud puddle. And butterflies depend on mud puddles, and it's, we have a term for it called puddling. And puddling is adult butterflies visit a mud puddle, and then they use it as a water, salt, and interest also uh, dissolved amino acids in mud puddles that the butterflies need to uh, successfully mate. And then finally, the last of the four basic elements of the butterfly garden, and this is probably one of the more important aspects, is we want to provide a safe, pesticide-free environment. So it's very important uh, to not use chemical insecticides, especially systemic ones, and we'll be talking a little more about that a little later in the presentation. And even when using uh, organic pesticides, we need to use caution because organic pesticides will, if sprayed indiscriminately, kill both caterpillars and adult butterflies. And then finally, if we're using herbicides, we want to use them for uh, only for weed emergencies. In other words, you don't want to make a habit of just spraying herbicides all over your yard. Now, the thing I want to review next is a little bit of butterfly biology so that we can understand how butterflies uh, live their life cycle and how this fits into butterfly gardening. So first, uh, we have to realize that butterflies and moths don't start life as an adult. They actually have three stages in their life cycle before they become the flying adult insect that we recognize. So first, we got to start, it's the proverbial chicken or the egg, in this case, butterfly or the egg. Well, here we see a slide of the mother, excuse me, of the mother butterfly laying eggs on a preferred plant that will hatch, and then the caterpillars will begin to feed on that plant. Next slide, please. Now, the eggs hatch, and then they turn into caterpillars, and the caterpillars begin life as a very small little caterpillar, and every uh, oh, few days they shed their exoskeleton and increase in size. So you can see a um, caterpillar here as it's uh, starting to develop. And then these caterpillars, once they grow to their full size, then they begin the dormancy process, and they metamorph they change from a caterpillar into a chrysalis or a cocoon. And you can see that on the right side of the screen. There is the caterpillar now in its chrysalis form. If it was a moth, it would be its cocoon form. And it takes, oh, some butterflies might uh, last stay in their uh, chrysalis or, or moth will stay in their cocoon for, oh, three or four weeks. Or sometimes they'll overwinter in the chrysalis or cocoon. Next slide. Then the caterpillars go through metamorphosis and emerge as a flying butterfly, an adult butterfly. And you can see this slide uh, illustrates beautifully, starting from the uh, left-hand corner of the picture. There's a developing chrysalis, and then the chrysalis begins to uh, turn clear as the caterpillar completes its metamorphosis into an adult butterfly, and then it chews its way out of the chrysalis, basically cuts open the little pod and emerges, and then uh, begins to flap its wings to uh, provide uh, blood to its wings and fully expand their wings. And then you see on the bottom of the photograph an adult butterfly uh, ready to fly away. And then once they have uh, hatched from their chrysalis, the butterflies immediately mate, lay eggs, feed on the nectar-rich plants that you plant in your yard, and then die, leaving behind the next generation of butterflies.
And one of, of course, the fun parts of butterfly gardening is planting for the butterflies because as gardeners, of course, we have a keen interest in flowers. And so if we want to attract adult butterflies to our garden, we want to plant nectar-rich flowers. Well, one easy way to do that is uh, purchasing our Butterfly Paradise pre-planned garden. And this was designed actually back in 1997 by Lauren Springer Ogden. And she created this beautiful, well-matched uh, garden that will provide nectar-rich flowers for butterflies from, the, um, from late spring right in through the fall. Next slide. Now, butterflies always have their favorite flowers, and we can all often recognize the flowers that butterfly, the adult butterflies like to visit most by their shapes. Butterflies love spiked flowers, and you can see a beautiful Laetrus or blazing star being fed on by uh, four beautiful monarch butterflies. Next slide. Butterflies also like flowers that are shaped with a flat top. And as you can see here, this is a close-up of uh, the orange butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa, with a monarch feeding on it. And you can see it's kind of flat top, so the, the uh, butterfly can land on it. And then you can see its long tongue, or proboscis, unfurled, reaching down into the individual florets to harvest the nectar. Uh, plants like yarrow, Achillea are another excellent flat-topped flower that uh, provide not only a landing space, but then uh, hundreds of little tiny flowers that the uh, butterfly, the adult butterflies, will sip individually. And then finally, many butterflies uh, enjoy a cone-shaped flower. And you can see in this slide, this is a prairie cone flower, or Retibita pinnata, very common over much of the central part of the United States. And you can see that there's a center cone where this is actually the sexual parts of the flowers which are filled with nectar. And so to pollinate the flower, the uh, butterflies or bees or <coughs> excuse me, whatever the pollinator is, go into the individual uh, little florets in the cone. Uh, purple cone flower as well as uh, retibitas are uh, very popular among butterflies. So the spike the flat-topped umbel and flowers with a center cone are generally the flowers that butterflies like best. But that's not all that we need to do when we garden for butterflies. We also need to plant to feed the caterpillars. So on the next slide here, we can see that uh, some very uh, common plants are often utilized as caterpillar food, but some butterflies are very specific in their foods required by their caterpillars. So butterflies that are kind of have caterpillars that are generalist type feeders will often use uh, plants like uh, the cherries, the oaks. They'll often utilize willows, poplars, birch trees, apple trees, alder trees, dandelions, and dill. Dill is particularly popular with the uh, caterpillars of the various swallowtails whereas the tiger swallowtail utilizes uh, ash trees. Now, a lot of people, of course, are very interested, and um, this is a wonderful thing, in helping to support monarch populations. So what do we do to plant for monarchs? Well, monarchs are an excellent example of a butterfly whose caterpillar has very specific uh, food plant needs. And in this case, Butterf the uh, monarch butterflies feed on milkweeds or butterfly weed. And they will only feed on these plants in the genus Asclepius. And the interesting thing why monarchs are so closely associated with the milkweeds is because as the uh, caterpillars ingest the distasteful milky sap of the milkweed plants, they incorporate this into the, their adult butterfly body. And uh, what birds have learned is when they see that distinctive orange pattern on the wings is that butterfly is going to have a very bitter taste and they're going to leave it alone. And in fact, there's an excellent example of a butterfly whose caterpillars don't feed on milkweeds but utilize the same protective mechanism by mimicking monarchs. And these are called viceroy butterflies, which to birds 
look just like a monarch, even though they, they are not bitter because their caterpillars don't feed on the milkweed. But monarchs do, and that's part of their protective mechanism. So if you want to attract uh, and feed monarch caterpillars, you need to plant something in the milkweed family. Next slide. Now, once you get butterflies into the yard, this is where it's extremely important to understand why you need to be very careful with chemical insecticides. It's important not to spray indiscriminately in your yard and kill caterpillars. Uh, I can't tell you how many times uh, I've heard people say, well, they enjoy the, the uh, wonderful adult butterflies, but gosh, these darn caterpillars in the yard, they've got to control those because they're eating my plants. Well, if you don't have caterpillars, you don't have adult butterflies. So it's important not to spray. And even when using organic formulations, a very common one that's used uh, in the United States is, is BT, or Bacillus thuringiensis, which is actually a type of bacteria that uh, you often would spray on uh, corn to kill corn uh, earworms. And uh, BT is a broad spectrum caterpillar killer and it will kill all moth and butterfly caterpillars. So if you're spraying your tomatoes or your corn to kill corn earworms, you need to be very careful that you just don't spray the whole garden, even with safe insecticides like Bacillus thuringiensis, because they are um, indiscriminate in infecting the gut of the butterfly caterpillar. And um, once it's in the gut, that basically stops the caterpillars from feeding and then they die a couple of days later. Now probably the most important thing to do is not use chemical insecticides in your garden. And uh, there are lots of chemical insecticides. Unfortunately, many of the uh, big box stores and garden centers that don't know any better sell lots of chemical insecticides and they sell a lot of systemic chemical insecticides. As you see here, this is probably one of the most commonly sold brands this is the uh, Bear Advanced Rose and Flower Care. Well, it's a systemic insecticide, which means when you spray it on the plants, the insecticide is absorbed through the leaf tissue and distributed through all parts of the plant, including flowers. And many of these formulations are neonicotinoids. And these neonicotinoids uh, are systemic and they are highly toxic. So when a systemically treated plant opens its flowers, these flowers are actually toxic and will poison the adult butterflies and moths. So even though these are purported to be safe, never use systemic insecticides in your garden. Next slide. And uh, many of us, of course, are vegetable gardeners as well as flower gardeners. And so all of us that have ever grown tomatoes are familiar with this great green creature that you see camouflaged beautifully in the photograph. Look carefully and you'll see a big upside down tomato hornworm. So if you plant tomatoes, you're going to have tomato hornworms, which are the caterpillar of the beautiful hawk moths. And hawk moths are those little hummingbird-like moths that pollinate flowers at dusk. And you'll often see them feeding on evening primroses, the Onotheras and hummingbird mint, the Agastaches. So rather than breaking out the Bacillus thuringiensis and killing all of the uh, caterpillar hornworms, just pick them off and uh, leave a few behind. You'll actually do it because you won't recognize all of them. That's, their camouflage is quite effective. And it's also good, just plant an extra tomato or two so that uh, there's plenty for the caterpillars to feed on and plenty of plants to provide you with a, an ample harvest of tomatoes. So I guess the uh, theme of this slide is share your crop. If you're planting for swallowtails and put in a lot of uh, uh, wonderful dill plants, plant extra so that the caterpillars have plenty of food and you've got plenty of seed heads for your pickling needs. Next slide. Now, one, this is a, a fabulous uh, nonprofit organization. This is called the Xerces Society. And this is a society that's a nonprofit that protects wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. Well, invertebrates are insects. These are 
uh, creatures that don't have an internal skeleton. That's what invertebrate means. And uh, the Xerces Society was established in 1971, and it's one of the it's on the forefront of invertebrate protection worldwide, harnessing the knowledge of scientists and enthusiasm of citizens around the country and around the world to implement conservation programs and to educate people about how to uh, take care of our pollinators like butterflies, bees, and other important insects because insects are uh, an essential part of the uh, circle of life on the planet. And the Xerces Society provides a lot of excellent education material. This is a new book that uh, came out last year that I highly recommend. And this is uh, Attracting Native Pollinators, Protecting North America's Bees and Butterflies. And you can see I've got the uh, website listed there. So I encourage you to join the society and uh, purchase uh, from their extensive library on a number of topics, including the attracting native pollinators. And then finally, for those of you who are really serious about your monarchs and are interested in milkweed cultivation, this is hot off the presses. This is a book entitled Milkweeds, a Conservation Practitioner's Guide. And it talks about the uh, plant ecology of milkweeds, it talks about seed production methods and habitat restoration opportunities to provide and reestablish and provide food for monarchs. Uh, that's the uh, main problem with the disappearance of monarchs is that the, the milkweed, their food source of the caterpillars is being destroyed uh, by uh, excessive use of herbicides over much of the uh, Midwestern part of the country where uh, monarchs uh, have their uh, a large portion of their native habitat. So I encourage you to uh, familiarize yourselves with the Xerces Society and uh, learn more about uh, butterflies, bees, and other uh, pollinators and beneficial insects. So this winds up uh, this, this afternoon's uh, presentation of butterfly gardening, and we're going to open up the uh, webinar to uh, your uh, questions about butterfly gardening. So please uh, type them in and um, they'll, the questions will be conveyed to me and I'll answer them. So again, thank you very much for uh, joining us this afternoon to learn about butterfly gardening. So David, we have one question. Um, one of our listeners would like to know what water sources can I give butterflies when water is scarce? Well, the, the key thing is uh, providing a mud puddle. Uh, butterflies are, are not like uh, birds or hummingbirds that like uh, fountains and uh, uh, misting nozzles and things like that. The way that butterflies get water, and in the water they also uh, uh, get their salts of sort, uh, their source of salt. So just have a mud puddle. And uh, you can, a mud puddle is as easy as just digging a very shallow depression and just uh, fill up the puddle every day. And uh, butterflies will quickly learn that it's there and available to them. So don't worry about a fountain or anything fancy. Just make a mud puddle. And um, another one is following up, um, if you have any specific drought time recommendations. Dr drought? Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, I didn't quite hear. Yes, if you have any rec specific drought time recommendations as to, you know, providing a puddle. Well, um, you know, you only need probably a, a couple of gallons of water to create a, a shallow mud puddle. So um, now if it's particularly dry, you may want to refill your mud puddle uh, morning and evening. Uh, but other than that, um, you know, providing a mud puddle is the same in a drought as it is in, an, in a time of ample rain, although rain will often fill up the mud puddle for you. All right. We have another question from someone who also lives in Santa Fe. Um, they'd like to know when we can expect to see pollinators out in forests as they are establishing a new garden. And they've seen some bees and, and one butterfly, but they would like to know what are the more typical season times. Well, the um, emergence of the adult butterflies out of their, uh, either the adults will overwinter in protected areas and then wake up in the spring, and that's generally who we see first are the overwintering adult butterflies. And, um, you know, that really varies by region, but 
I would say here in Santa Fe, uh, we'll see a few scattered butterflies in March, but uh, depending on the weather and how quickly or slowly it begins to warm, the primary population of butterflies will increase when they start to hatch from their crystalluses, or in the case of moths, when they hatch from their cocoons, which generally in, say, USDA Zone uh, 5 and 6, which uh, includes Santa Fe, uh, that would be late March, early April. Uh, areas of the country that have um, uh, milder winters and the last average frost date uh, is, is uh, earlier in the year, you know, you might see the initial uh, populations of adult butterflies emerging from their chrysalises in, um, you know, late February, early March. So it just really depends on your season. But they will begin to emerge before the last average frost date. So that's why it's important not to uh, cut down and clean up your garden until about mid-spring, wherever that, whenever that is in your region. All right, we have another question about um, milkweed this time. Um, they'd like to know whether milkweed should be offered in the spring or the fall garden. Well, um, milkweeds, again, are a not only a source of nectar for the adult butterflies, but most importantly, milkweeds are a source of food for the caterpillars. So caterpillars, um, you know, depending where you are, um, if you just plant the milkweed and then the caterpillars, the adult butterflies will lay eggs on the milkweed and then the caterpillars will, will emerge. Um, generally, the monarchs have, uh, I believe it's a single generation uh, per year. Some places they may have two generations per year. So um, just plant the milkweed so that they're available whenever the uh, adult monarchs are flying around looking for a place to lay their eggs. Now, the adult monarchs will feed on the flowers of milkweeds. Uh, it really depends where you are in the United States and, and where their migration routes are in uh, relation to where you live. But um, basically, monarchs will find a milkweed in bloom. So just plant them, get them going, and don't worry uh, about uh, when they bloom or uh, when they wake up. It will be in cycle with the monarchs. Okay. Um, we've got another listener who would like to know, where can I find out what caterpillar food plants are good for my zone? Well, I would uh, refer people to the Xerces Society. Um, they have a lot of um, excellent, excellent uh, regional information because uh, butterfly populations really do vary um, from even say if you live in Texas, what's uh, flying around in Lubbock is very, very different than flying around in Beaumont or Laredo. So um, you can also uh, let's see what other sources. You might just check with your um, um, local, um, uh, well, actually, the Xerxes Society, I don't know if they have any local chapters, but that's where I would go first, and then they can point you in the right direction to find out the butterflies that are most common in your region. Okay. Um, we've got another question. It says, many people use lawn care services to take care of their weeds. They spray about five to six times per year. Um, what are your thoughts? Should we cease using these companies? Yes. Or uh, have them modify what they're spraying on your yard. Um, I think it's very important that uh, whoever uh, one uses for maybe it's an individual landscaper or uh, you know a franchised lawn care company. It's extremely important that you understand what chemicals are being used on your yard and insist that they uh, use organic methods. And if they don't, you may need to switch uh, services uh, in terms of the lawn care service. Um, now I know that they're starting. Uh, more and more, there are lawn care services that specialize in organic lawn care. And probably the most important thing you can do for the environment is to take care of your lawn organically. We um, pour more chemicals and insecticides, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides 
on our lawns than we even do on um, large uh, agribusiness farms. So uh, we need to be very careful as to what we put on the lawns. So ask and learn what's being used in your yard. All right. Um, another question we, we got in was whether there are specific milkweed uh, varieties for different areas. Well, there are. Um, some milkweed species are very widely distributed. Um, let me see, Asclepius uh, syriacus is the most common butterfly weed, and that's uh, found over much of the uh, Midwest, up into uh, southern Canada and down to the Gulf Coast. But then as you move west, um, the predominant milkweed out here in the western U.S. is Asclepius speciosus. So um, what I recommend is go, um, is just Google um, Asclepius and the United States Department of Agriculture, they have an excellent um, database that shows the ranges of native plants, all types of native plants across, the, uh, uh, across North America. So I like to go to this uh, USDA site and you can see exactly where the different Asclepius are native. Although they uh, will grow in many, even if they're not native to your part of the country, uh, many milkweeds are very adaptable and can be grown uh, quite widely. All right, and we have one more question. Um, how can we protect caterpillars from predators? Well, caterpillars uh, have been evolving over probably uh, 100,000 years to protect themselves from predators. So there's nothing that we really need to do other than um, providing a, a, the bigger the area of their food plants, the better. For example, if you have two dill plants, it's going to be a lot easier for uh, a bird to uh, eventually find the caterpillars as opposed to if you have 20 dill plants. So I would say the main thing is just to provide as large a, a habitat as you can, whether it be plantings of food plants for the caterpillars um, or, you know, the adult butterflies, they like to hide in brush piles and things like that. So as long as you provide the basics of a butterfly garden, the caterpillars will do quite well fending for themselves. All right. Um, well, that's it for questions. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone for attending today's Butterfly Gardening webinar, and thank you, David, for the presentation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be creating um, a video that can be downloaded and watched so you can watch the presentation later or share it with others. And then we invite you to attend our next webinar on creating habitat, and this is scheduled for Thursday, April 9th at 11 a.m. Mountain, 1 p.m. Eastern. And you can register for that by going to highcountrygardens.com slash webinar or just searching for webinar in the search box at the top of the, e the uh, website. And we'll also send you a follow-up email with a link to register for that. Um, so thanks again for attending, and we look forward to having you join us again. Thank you, David. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us this afternoon, and happy butterfly gardening.